Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. And welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. Katie, before I begin, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, that's a great question, Scott. As I was walking through our brand new agriculture exhibit on farming innovation, I walked past um, a cute little chicken figurine in there, and it said that there are around 8 billion chickens consumed each year in the U.S. alone. And that's a lot of chicken. It's a lot of chickens. <laughs> where, where do you go to get your favorite chicken? Oh, you know I love Chick-fil-A. I knew that. I was set up for that. So it's it's such a coincidence that you brought up agriculture because we have a really uh, interesting agriculture related uh, guest today. Samuel Goldberg is a film, television, theater, and live events producer based in New York City, a little ways from here. But Samuel contributed to a farm safety section in our exhibit on innovation in agriculture, and we're featuring his film Silo that just opened up in more than two hundred theaters around the country. Welcome, Samuel. Thanks for having me, Scott. Um, congratulations. First of all, just to get anything open, you know, this close to the what we're hoping is the beginning of the end of the pandemic is is quite a feat. So bravo for that. Thanks. I mean, our film is weirdly a beneficiary of timing right now that the world has started to open up and people are looking to go to movie theaters and we're a film that struck some interest. So we're, we're getting out there. And you and I first started talking about agriculture and safety and innovation around the time of the beginning of the pandemic last March. And so it's kind of interesting that now we're getting to talk about your film uh, hitting theaters. Yeah. And, and also congratulations is due to you and your team for opening up this incredible park and honoring us with a feature in your exhibits. You know, it's uh, Dale Dobson, who is the head of safety for the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, called me and just said, I never in a million years could have imagined that a grain rescue tube I helped invent would be showcased in a place like this. So you you all have made some very hardworking, very kind people very happy. That's, that's incredible. And we're going to go into a little bit more about that in a minute. But first of all, uh, we want to find out a little bit more about you. Tell us about where you grew up and, and uh, what your childhood was like and what, what was your path to getting here today? Well, um, it's not a path that I would have thought would end, uh, you know, end me up on a, on a podcast connecting with you, you know, being in West Tennessee. I'm a born and bred New York City kid. You know, grew up going to Central Park to play tackle football with my friends, Riverside Park to play basketball. I used to joke, you know, what's it like growing up in New York City? The lights flashing, don't cross the street and your mom rushes you across. Like that's the vibe. Um and uh, from a very young age, uh, I wanted to be in the entertainment business. I loved acting. I used to do Ace Ventura and Austin Powers impressions in the mirror. And I told my mom I wanted to try and act. And we had a neighbor, Elaine Gorney, who auditioned every day in New York City for TVs and TV shows and commercials and, and movies. And she recommended an agency. And, and I got an agent when I was eight years old. And I started leaving school every day at around noon and going to audition for stuff. And so I was in, you know, a bunch of radio voiceovers and I did some commercial work and I was in a film and I was in my early teenage years. And I just, I don't know, I just loved it. I liked performing. I liked emoting. I liked connecting with people around those creative arts, but I didn't wake up every day wanting to act. And if you're going to be in that side of the business, you have to, you have to wake up every day wanting to be a professional actor. You have to wake up every day wanting to perform. And I like wanted to play basketball with friends. And so I took a hiatus from performing until I went to university in Philadelphia and I studied film and English. And I started going to the other side of the camera, writing, directing, producing theater and film. And when I graduated the university of Pennsylvania in 2009, uh, I started working on documentaries, uh, predominantly ones that all had a social action or a philanthropic element to them. So first documentary I helped produce 
was about the survivors of different genocides working together in the genocide prevention movement in Washington, D.C., at the time, very focused on Darfur. Um, then I worked on a documentary actually about bringing information technology to people who live in the Amazon jungle. Fascinating subject that was all about how is the internet changing connectivity and bringing people online and human nature. Uh, but I always wanted to be producing the scripted movies that I grew up loving. You know, I wanted to work on Forrest Gump. I wanted to work on Braveheart. I wanted to work on As Good As It Gets. Like these were the movies of my childhood that I loved. And I wanted to try and figure out, could I could I produce something like that that could be commercial and empathetic and artful? And so uh, I started developing scripts and seeing if I could get them turned into movies. Nothing was really clicking. It's very hard to develop a screenplay that eventually becomes a multi-million dollar movie. Uh, probably 1% of all scripts become films and probably 1% of all films turn a profit. So do the math, pretty, pretty bad odds. But I was pitched a movie idea in 2014, September of 2014, by a director from East Tennessee named Marshall Burnett. He's from Johnson City. And he was living in Nashville at the time, developing different scripts that he wanted to turn into movies. But he had just heard an NPR story about a grain entrapment incident. And although he grew up you know, around a lot of agriculture, he didn't understand the functionality of silos and grain bins and didn't really understand much about agriculture at all. But he knew that it was important to tell the story of rural America, not in a pandering or condescending way, but an authentic way, because it seemed that there were ever more seldom depictions of small town America in independent film. And I, that idea resonated with me, the, like sort of philanthropically, not philanthropically, just existentially. This idea that we're kind of this country that's more and more divided along urban and rural lines. And here's a kid from a smaller town, you know, or a small city, at least in East Tennessee. And here's a kid from the Big Apple. Maybe we could work together to create something that could produce empathy and raise awareness, but most of all, just be entertaining in a high quality film. Now you, you, so that, can't, you can't always believe everything that you read on the internet. So I want to make sure is the true story. What I read was that it was three Illinois teens who fell into a grain bin um, and two of them unfortunately died and one did survive. Um, is that the story that inspired the thinking? Yeah. So Marshall pitched me this movie called Silo and the NPR story was that it's the infamous Mount Carroll, Illinois incident that you referenced, Scott. It was a 14 year old, an 18 year old, and a 19 year old went into a bin and only one of them came out, Will Piper. Um, and uh, the other two boys passed away and we didn't want to tell that story exactly because it just you know, felt like it would be too difficult to stomach even for the friends and family of that community. But also we did want to ultimately tell a hopeful story uh, and so we developed a script called Silo based on this idea that a grain entrapment happens on just any other day on the farm. You know, you never, nobody ever expects the awful thing to happen the day it happens. And so we just sort of show a day in the life of an American farm where this does happen and the community needs to band together to save a life. And so 2014, I was pitched that idea. You know, obviously it's 2021 now, so it didn't happen overnight, but we spent three years developing a screenplay. We spent a few months producing the film in Kentucky and in Iowa. We spent almost a year editing the film in post-production. And uh, we have done a lot of educational screenings of the film since August of 2019. And we've collaborated with, you know, obviously interesting and important institutions such as yourselves. Uh, but we're about to, and we are releasing across North America, May 7th, um, to basically anybody who wants to watch it. The movie's gonna be in over 200 theaters, but it's also gonna be on cable on demand going to be on iTunes and people can watch it on our website. So it's, it's what's called a day and date release, which means kind of all at once the movie is available. And it's, it's such an important topic that is so relevant and more of these tragedies take place than people would realize just um, like two weeks ago, a uh, lady in Henry County in Indiana um, was 76 uh, and she uh, became trapped and unfortunately passed away. Um, and if more, you know, rescue squads and more communities knew and were prepared to, you know, to get in there with the right equipment to help people, then uh, there wouldn't be, this wouldn't happen. So um, it's important. I, I totally agree. I mean, that story really hit me in the gut. In the seven years I've worked on this, I've never heard of a woman dying in a grain bin. She was in there with her 81-year-old husband and... It's unfathomable. It's just a, it's a horrible way to die. There's no other way to put it. It's a viscerally horrendous thing that happens. 
And yeah, our, our movie is both ideally going to help people get trained on the reactive elements of rescue, but also be proactive and kind of really like scaring farmers a little bit into just taking that extra five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds to call their wife and say, Hey, I'm going into the bin or go grab a harness or tell a friend to not turn on the auger or have a spotter or not go in the bin at all. There are a lot of different ways to prevent these. These are pretty preventable tragedies. They do happen on average, 35 to 40 times a year. And those are just the ones that are reported. There are a lot of ones there. I've had a lot of farmers come up to me and say, oh yeah, great movie. I, I was trapped in a bin actually. And my, my dad got me out. They didn't tell anybody. It was lucky they got out because more than half of these end in fatality. And thanks to you, we made the connection uh, with Turtle Plastics, who provided a turtle tube that is in our exhibit on innovation in agriculture. Um, and it's it's such a simple idea. It's a sleeve that goes down around the person who's entrapped and can actually save their life. We've got one of those on display in a big grain bin in our exhibit. Um, and, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, visitors to Discovery Park are now seeing it. It's actually in uh, the grain bin. We actually have corn in it. So people are also touching the corn and playing with it. So it's a, it's good to see because most of us haven't seen what grain looks like in a, you know, we see them from the distance, but we haven't seen what it looks like inside. So, um, it, uh, turtle plastics was really generous. These, these only cost like $1,200. So, you know, to me, if you had a grain bin, it could make sense to have one nearby that you could use in case of an emergency. So, yeah, a lot of large operations are starting to purchase the turtle rescue sleeve, um, because it is, a, the cost of this happening on your farm is, you know, immeasurable. If it's a family farm, it's probably going out of business. And if it's a large farm, there's probably a very large and very bad situation that'll happen. Um, and the Turtle Company is fantastic. They're just a really philanthropic company out of Ohio. They donate almost 25% of their annual revenue to charity, which is a massive number. Uh, you know, they're not a Fortune 500 company. Um, and they did. They, they they created this rescue sleeve and. They're getting it out there. And, and I do hope people have awareness of it. And like you're saying, Scott, even just somebody coming around and touching the corn and having that synapse fire, the physical and the intellectual and say, well, this is real. This is this corn is going to end up at an ethanol plant, which will end up in fuel that fuels my car. This corn will end up with cattle feed. You know, I'm a big chicken eater, too, Katie. Uh, you know, this might end up, uh, you know, in the stomach of a chicken. You know, like this is. This is a big part of our economy and a big part of how we live. And, you know, you could be a vegan, but you still got to care about farmers and what they go through. You know, it's an important, important job. And it's, it's the oldest occupation pretty much in the world. Now, since you started working on Silo, um, last time we talked, you had um, actually started dreaming of a place for you to put seeds in the ground yourself. Have you pursued that? Yeah. So, Scott, my bio needs an update. <laughs> um, I, I'm no longer up, you know, based in New York City. I, I am uh, calling in from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. We're in eastern Pennsylvania, about five minutes from the Delaware River, about 10 minutes from where Washington crossed the Delaware. Um, and we stare over into New Jersey and I'm on an eight acre uh, old tomato farm. Uh, my wife and I are going to start planting our garden uh, in about two weeks and get our hands dirty. So uh, we have a young daughter and this movie is totally changed my perspective just on my own life and how important it is to me to have a very um, localized community that I can rely on for what I need. You know, I, I buy, you know, I buy my steaks down the road and, and I'm sourcing our grain from down the road and it's kind of a very nice existence. Um, but also I just wanted to have a more, you know, direct relationship with nature. I love New York city. I can't believe I moved out of New York City. I was a ride or die kind of guy. Um, I mean, I used to do live, like you said, I do live events. I, I would do live events across Manhattan and work with musicians and painters and documentarians. And I miss it. I miss that energy. But I feel like for this chapter of my life and moving forward, and especially for our daughter, this just feels like an important thing for us. So here I am in, in Pipersville, Pennsylvania. That sounds like a documentary to me. So. <laughs> it could be. I mean, it's, <laughs> I've been journaling all along the way, and I've certainly thought about putting those journals together. And, you know, I've, I'm lucky. I've developed a very unique perspective on the subject of agriculture, right? I'm, 
I'm an outsider and uh, I've become an insider, but I started as somebody who knew nothing, Scott. Like I knew zero about agriculture in 2014 when I was pitched this movie. It was, I, I won't say it's embarrassing. I wasn't taught it. It wasn't my lifestyle. A lot of people don't know, but you know, it's one of the challenges people in agriculture face is most people are now three, four generations removed from the farm. And so their empathy for and their understanding of modern day agriculture is very limited. And it's not that people would ever judge or not like a farmer. Farmers are like some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, if not the nicest. But when you don't experience something or have a personal connection to it, I kind of liken it to the military in America. You know, we're also a couple of generations removed now from everybody knowing somebody who is drafted into a war. And so we're desensitized from war because we're, we're far from it. You know, it's not the best analogy, but the idea is we're, we're getting further and further away from these local smaller towns and people who are doing this important work. And I'm hoping our movie has an impact on building empathy for those communities. Um, and I honestly, I know that we have, I'm proud to say that we have done a good job in that, but there's a long way to go. And so I want to back up a little bit um, and talk about uh, the production of something like this. So I've been fortunate enough to get to see it, and it's just the production values are just off the charts fantastic. Um, I don't know who to thank for that, you know, because I don't, you know, I don't, and a lot of our listeners may not knew, know what the different roles are of people who who produce a film like that. So can you just give us like a little 101 on film production? Awesome. Uh, I love, I love that question. It's so fun to talk about. Um, so I'm, I'm what's called the lead producer of silo. Uh, and what my, I'm basically the CEO of a company and that company is an independent film. And it's not just a piece of art for art's sake that goes up in a gallery. It's a business. You know, I had to raise over a million dollars, you know, a good amount more than that to go make this film. But I also worked with the director and the screenwriters who developed the script and read every of the 45 drafts that we wrote. And I also hired the hair and makeup artist and the costume designer and the lighting technicians. Uh, so when you work on a film, you're usually working with a fairly large crew. You know, if it's a Warner Brothers movie like Ocean's Eleven, it's probably 500 people. A movie like ours is about 45 crew and then our actors on set every day. Um, and every crew breaks up into different departments and the production quality on silo is in large part due to those departments doing a great job. Our gaffer was the head of lighting. Brilliant. Our cinematographer, Hunter, unbelievably talented. And he got us these incredible lenses from Panavision, the famous company that made the movie look beautiful and had scope and it caught these sunsets and these vistas, you know, our hair and makeup artist. That's what makes the actors look good on screen. Our costume designer nailed it. And then ultimately our screenwriter writes the script and without a good script, you can't make a good movie. And Jason is a brilliant writer. And Marshall, our director is the one who's in charge of the tone and taking all those disparate pieces and departments and making sure they work together to create a cohesive looking and feeling and sounding film. Uh, and I only, I only mentioned a fraction of the crew. A lot more people did a lot. I mean, the person who comes every day and provides the food is crucial. I mean, you're getting two to three meals a day and people have to be well fed and feel good about it. And so it takes a village to make it happen. The unique thing with Silo in terms of production quality and production value is that we made three major partnerships on this movie that cost us zero dollars that probably gave us over a million dollars in in-kind value. The first one is related to the turtle rescue sleeve, actually. And that was Dale Dobson, who I referenced earlier. Dale's the head of safety for the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. He was on set most days, making sure that we did all things authentically and safely. He came with fire trucks, police cars, extras, EMTs. Every day, if we needed something, Dale was Johnny on the spot. And he was the greatest tailwind we could ever have. He was an incredible friend of mine. And he's an amazing person. If you're ever privileged to meet him, meet him. He is an one of a kind personality. Um, secondly, we, the farm we filmed on affinity farms, we did not pay to spend two months on their farm yet. They let us. And every day, Quint and his wife, Leah and Quint's dad, Ramey were there. They were moving tractors and combines and planters. They were sitting with the actors. Hey, this is how it would sound. This is the verbiage you should use in this scene. This will make it look authentic. They were there every day, making sure that things looked authentic. So we had our firefighter person in Dale and the firefighter expertise. Then we had the farmer and Quint and his dad and the farmer expertise. And then we had to figure out how are we going to pretend to engulf actors in a 50,000 bushel, 50 foot high grain bin? 
with a, but it, Warner Brothers would spend ten million dollars on the set that we had. We partnered with the Sukup Manufacturing Company. They're the largest family-owned grain bin and grain dryer company in the world. They're based out of Northern Iowa, and they decided they were going to build those sets for us for free. So we we went to Northern Iowa. We went into an airplane hangar, and they built two fake sets where we could pretend to do all this stunt work. It was such a daring collaboration on their part, and such an exciting collaboration on our part. And the entire film hinged on them coming to the table with all of this. And in large part to those three individuals, the Dobson guy, the Pottinger family, and the Sukup family, we were able to make this movie because we were a little engine that could. Um, and I do think that people, if and when people see the film, they'll be like, wow, that that looks like a bigger budget than it was. And I can almost nice. guarantee you it yeah. wasn't as much money as you would expect. Yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. I mean, it's um, Thank it's you. really a great film. I hope a lot of people get to see it. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about Silo and some other aspects of film production. In their new web series, singer songwriters Drew and Ellie Holcomb load up for an epic sixteen hundred mile road trip through Tennessee. They're exploring the state they grew up in with their kids, finding inspiration together, and even writing some songs along the way, all while traveling safe. Experience their adventure by searching Holcomb on TNVacation.com, then plan your own Tennessee road trip. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or or your podcast catcher of choice. I am here with Samuel Goldberg. Little known fact, if you can believe the internet, he played the teenage version of Ben Stiller's character in Keeping the Faith. Is that true? Oh, my God. You guys said you wouldn't spring anything on me. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a resume. That should be at the top. That's incredible. Do you ever run into Ben Stiller and say, hey, I'm you as a teenager. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, man. So that was the coolest experience when I was, as I mentioned, I was auditioning as a kid. And, you know, I auditioned for the movie Ransom. I auditioned to be the Anakin Skywalker kid in Star Wars Episode One. I actually got two callbacks and thought I might actually get that. Uh, and then, you know, one day I got called to an audition and they said, you're going to meet the director of the movie. And it was Edward Norton, who was and probably still is my favorite actor. He had just done American History X, Rounders, and Primal Fear. And that guy was the coolest. And he cast me in this movie to play a young Ben Stiller, a young rabbi, which, you know, in a different podcast is not too far from my from my bio. Um, and, uh, and basically spent, you know, a couple months on set all around New York City filming that movie. Um, I did see Ben Stiller again recently. Uh, one of my close friends from childhood, Neil Goldman, uh, he's a producer on a on a pretty big uh, late night you know talk show, and Stiller was on, and and he, and he told me to come, and he brought me into the green room, and we reconnected like eighteen years later or something. He was really nice. It was kind of one of those fun moments, and uh, yeah, I mean Ben Stiller is one of those actors who is not just a great actor; he's like a brilliant director and writer and statesman and philanthropist. So. Uh, that was uh, that was a cool experience. It was my claim to fame for a while, I guess. I guess until Silo. <laughs> I'm sure um, the other kids in your school were freaking out uh, and thinking that was super cool. Did it bother you as a kid? Because you know, I have I have grown up kids now, but when they were little, I, and I had friends who would you know put their kids in modeling or um, movies or whatever. Did it crush you when you didn't get a gig that you wanted? Great question. You know. I'm so lucky my parents handled things really well. Um, it never felt like a stage parenting thing. It was, it felt like a hobby. So the stakes were never too high. You know, I never, I never had pressure. Did I get dejected when I missed out on something? Sure. I was cast as um, Billy Crystal's son and analyzed this. And it was like the big break. Um, and then they changed the character to a girl. And they changed it back to a boy and they didn't cast me. And I was like bummed. Like, I love Billy Crystal. That guy's the coolest. <laughs> um, but it never lived too long. My parents kept me balanced. I, you know, I had other hobbies. I played basketball. I liked other things. So I have to say it never, I don't think it ever cut too deep for me. I, I, I'm, I'm very blessed in that I, 
I had a good surrounding family and school and friend group that kept, you know, kept me on a good humble path. It also, it gave you an opportunity to see production from the other side, obviously. So um, probably when you're involved in casting, you're probably, you know, a little bit more considerate than somebody who's never been on the other side, who's, you know, waiting to be cut. That's a good call. That's totally true. I, I think I see everything from an actor's perspective. I love acting. I, I still take acting classes. Um, I enjoy it immensely. And when you're developing a film, you're basically developing human through human psychology. You're saying... This is a character. This is their makeup. Why did they get this way? And then this is a character. This is their makeup. Why would they do this thing? And the thing they do is a plot point. And then you hit another plot point. And then another character reacts. And you go down that line until you've made a movie. So right now I'm developing another film with Jason who wrote Silo. And we're basically just exploring human psychology for hours at a time. And it's easier to do that with an acting background because that is what acting is. It's essentially therapy. You're taking your experiences, you're finding a, you know, a vessel for them through another character, but making them uniquely your own. And that's when it really is its most enjoyable because you get this outlet for the anxieties that we all have in life. Um, everybody has their unique experience, but we all have you know, stresses and you find an outlet for them that also is creative and maybe can give somebody else some enjoyment and some perspective you know, as well. Well, and I love uh, Steve Buscemi and Jane Krakowski, and I saw where you did Mildred and the Dying Parlor. You were executive producer of that? I, I produced that. I also lead produced that. Um, yeah, that's a great That was my first kind of successful project, uh, 2015, 2016. It got into the Tribeca Film Festival and eventually was bought as a TV show by Warner Brothers. It didn't get made yet as a TV show, but it might. That was the best. Um, Steve Buscemi is the literally everything you read about that person and you should read about him. There's a great profile about him in GQ last year. He's one of the most wonderful people that I've ever met in my life. I mean, well, that's good to hear. I've, I love the film and, um, I love him. And so it's good to hear that, uh, what I think is true is true. He's special. He's special. He just has an aura about him, a humility about him. And he's, he's the most talented person. He's, I mean, He's the most talented actor I've had the privilege of working with. He did things on set that were not on the script that he invented that basically made the movie work. And Jane Krakowski from, you know, 30 Rock and all of her stuff. I mean, she's amazing. She was so talented. And then Evan, John Akite and Zasha Mamet were a married couple who also starred. I mean, that was a really cool project. We filmed it at a friend's house over a weekend and a half. And <laughs> Yeah, that was a fun one. You're digging up some good stuff, Scott. I like it. <laughs> yeah, anybody who's listening who hasn't seen it needs to go. And uh, nowadays, you can just about find anything you know to watch on one of the many uh, places you can watch stuff. So, um, so I, the, your your film Silo reminds me a lot of our exhibit, our ag exhibit, because we started off. None of us knew anything about agriculture, and so we dug in the same way you dug in the film. One of the things that I did. Um, that I'm curious if you did was attend uh, some of the shows like the Farm Progress show that takes place uh, in Iowa. Uh, did you do some of those kind of ag shows? Yeah, both before and after the production of the film. So before the production, we did a lot of research and development, uh, basically in three major groups, uh, educators, farmers, and firefighters. And we just spent time with individuals uh, asking them about their experiences um, and also, you know, like we connect with Purdue, University of Purdue and University of Illinois, University of Kentucky, and they just have these amazing departments for agriculture and they, and they introduce you to people. So those are kind of our initial, um, I guess, inroads to the space. Uh, when we finally made Silo uh, and we're finished making the film, we attended a couple of other conferences. The first conference actually I ever attended wasn't even a farm, farming one. It was a fire rescue one called FDIC. Uh, it's in Indianapolis every year. It's the largest indoor fire rescue department in North uh, conference in North America. And we just met people in that space. In fact, we partnered uh, on the film now with the national fall firefighters foundation and a portion of all proceeds are going to their nonprofit because we just love what they do and they're supporting the film and getting it out to their fire departments. Uh, but when it was time to release silo, right? So you've got an independent film, you finance it independently. It's a speculative endeavor. You don't know how people are going to see it. You don't know how you're going to make money on it. So we figured, okay, what's the demographic that's going to be most interested in this project? Is it the Sundance Film Festival audience or 
are, are farmers? Is it farmers? So we actually premiered Silo at the Farm Progress Show when it was on its off year from Iowa, when it was in Decatur, Illinois. And that was August 27th of 2019. And we put it out there that if anybody wanted to watch this film, it wasn't available commercially. So you couldn't just watch it online. You'd have to license it from us for a community event. And the idea was Silo was made with the help of community. It's about a small community. Let's use it as an educational resource for communities to get people together and fortify fortify the community, but also talk about farm safety and youth on the farm and mental health and agriculture and these other subjects that are tackled in the film. And so after Farm Progress, we then went on to play a lot of really awesome farm shows, the American Farm Bureau Federation's conference in Austin, Texas, the DTM conference in Chicago, Husker Harvest Days in Ohio. Oh, man, so many exciting ones. The FFA conference in Indianapolis. And that's just been a great experience because you can meet so many people at once. And it really was the kind of launch pad for the film's marketing and publicity. And, you know, from between August 2019 and now, uh, we've done almost 250 of those in-person events. And it's reached about 65, 70,000 people. Now that the movie is commercially available and there's already a lot of audience awareness of it, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, positive and kind of... Uh, I don't know. I'm feeling really good about the fact that people will know our movie is out there and will want to go watch it because we've already kind of been blessed to to show and prove that there is a captive audience for this kind of content. Well, those one thing you, I started going to my first ones part, as part of the research for our ag exhibit. And one thing that sort of blew my mind is it felt a little bit like South by Southwest with gigantic tractors. You know, it was yeah. just it was, just, it was yeah. that same vibe you know, that you get it at any kind of big, large gathering of people who are passionate about a particular topic. And no matter who you talk to, they wanted to talk about our exhibit, just like I'm sure they wanted to talk about your film. There's just such a passion there for for all things agriculture and helping the bigger world learn more about what goes on uh, here in these agriculture communities. A hundred percent could not agree more. It's such an invigorating experience, especially when you're doing something unique. You know, what you all did with Discovery Park is a very unique thing. And so you came, you kind of were a big fish in a small pond. Same for Silo. You know, there's never been a movie made about grain entrapment and there are very few movies made about agriculture in general. So we felt like we had a leg up and people were really interested in what we were doing. So it was just very gratifying to see that interest. Obviously, if the movie were bad, it wouldn't matter. And I'm glad that people like the movie because you make something and, you know, you just don't know. You never know if people are going to like it or not. It's pretty vulnerable. Um, I, I knew we were on to something when we had finished production that we had enough good footage to make a good film. I probably I, I didn't expect it to be this well received. I'm, you know, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Pretty happy about it. Well, congratulations. And I'm so glad that uh, we connected. And I'm really grateful that you're represented in our exhibit and safety in agriculture is represented and that we can have even just a little bitty bit of helping people know more about the film. Well, thank you. I mean, when you all reached out, it was one of those, this is just totally cool and unique. I cannot wait to connect. And we connected right away. You know, you and your team, Scott, are just incredibly efficient and heartfelt and easy to work with. You can't say that about everybody. So, you know, thanks for doing what you all do. It's it's a totally different but tactile way to experience agriculture. And I think that tactility is important and people need to get out of their comfort zones and leave their cities or small towns and get to know really what's happening out there in wide open spaces around the country. So I'm super grateful we connected and, you know, I hope your audience is interested in the film, but definitely I hope they're interested in, in what you're doing too. It's just a, it's a really, really great collaboration. So thank you. Now, when you get that next um, ag project going, let us know, and we'll figure out some more ways we can work together. Definitely. We're developing the next one now. It's about dairy farmers, so we'll, we'll be talking about it. Right up our alley. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get going. And if, you're, uh, if your audience is interested, you know, they can get a list of all of our movie theaters and the platforms we're playing on. They can even buy DVDs or, or stream the film directly from our website. And it's silo the film.com, silo the film.com, at silo the film on all of our social handles and platforms. But uh, yeah, it is worth mentioning that, you know, we're partnered with three different charities National Fall Firefighters, I mentioned, also Progressive Agriculture, who do youth and safety, as well as John Down High School, which is the only FFA in the five boroughs of New York City. They have a five acre campus in Queens. Wow. It's awesome. So each of those organizations are going to be getting a portion of proceeds and uh, we just want to keep supporting the community. So reach out to us on the website. If you have ideas, if you want to connect, 
you know, we just want to keep telling this story. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates. Music